back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very excited to have the one and only Mr. James Green, a.k.a. Slim, snapped on the pod with us today. James, how you doing, my friend? I am doing great. It's been a, it's been a good day. How are you doing today? Can't complain. I booked a gig today. You know, it's Tuesday. It snowed. I'm a snow girly. I fucking love the snow. So, you know, it's it's all good stuff. <laughs> your snow and your iced coffee. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know me, man. I'm a December yes. baby. People always give me grief for it, but iced coffee all year and that's it that's i live by it and i die by it (laughs) no 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 (laughs) 600 grams of sugar per week i think starbucks (laughs) needs to start paying for my future diabetes medication (laughs) can uh can you give a quick introduction to the listeners to uh to who you are so yeah i'm james green aka slim snapped i am currently based out of phoenix arizona moved here from indianapolis with my wife and may of 2020 moved on our anniversary graduate wow. dental school she graduated dental school we packed up the truck moved to phoenix or goodyear sight unseen and um been here since in love in the desert nice so you grew up in indianapolis and yeah a town about an hour south off of 70 so it's the halfway point between Terre Haute and indianapolis called cloverdale mm-hmm. it's a tiny little it was like a one stoplight town at the time, and now it's maybe three stoplights. So nice. That gives you the size. Yeah, it's a tiny. <laughs> so I grew up there, and then we lived in Indianapolis for four years while she was in dental school. Nice. I like Indy. Cool city. One of my uh, college friends lives there, and she's a real estate agent. Always posting yeah. these like amazing houses that, if they were in Arizona or New Jersey, they'd be like seven hundred grand. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's like the low key spot. I mean, I love it. It's not Chicago. It's like not a big hub, but there's so much to do that's mm. un, like isn't expected so i mean it's a it's, i think it'll be low-key for a little longer than i think it'll have a have its moment yeah from a from a business perspective was that a big shift for you you know as a photographer clientele base going from one state to another i'm sure that was kind of a hard transition how how was that for you so actually i really had it started my business <laughs> before i moved so um basically i'd shot you know i'd had photography in my life on and off from you know elementary on and then when we moved i was in working in her college town we moved um i was playing men's rugby and got oh, shit. yes i got a really bad concussion and oh. split my face open so she was like no more rugby we're done done with that and i was like understandable you know i just got a really bad i got like three concussions in a season probably should stop. yeah um, so, so then she basically asked me what i wanted to do and i was like I want to pick up photography again. So she bought me a camera with some money and then she was like, here you go. So then ever since then I've been, you know, back behind the camera, but, um, which I think before we left, I think I refused like four weddings. I refused weddings nonstop and then moved out here. It was COVID and I had nothing to do. Um, and then, so I ended up picking, picking up weddings. So it was like a, it was a fresh start moving out here from Indianapolis, completely different, you know, different yeah. clientele, different, different landscape in general, man. I, uh, first of all, we became friends on Twitter, which I was, I always think that's fucking funny. And then <laughs> you sent me some film to shoot, which was sick. Um, which I think is just cool. Like internet friends, just like exchanging gear and like fucking taking pictures. I don't know. It's just cool. <laughs> um, and it's just funny to me because like in this podcast, I get to like meet a lot of people that I am wildly impressed by. And I've had the benefit of having these conversations with a lot of different photographers. And I've always found your style of wedding photographer to be much more like artistic centric than your run of the mill, you know, wedding photographer. I I, I think there's a lot of care and thought that goes into your day. Um, Was that like sort of an immediate thing for you when you started doing wedding photography or was that something that developed over time? I would say partially that that was kind of why I never wanted to do it. I wanted to kind of have creative freedom. Mm -hmm. And the person that um, kind of gave me the reins was, her name is Kim Skinner. And she, I said, refuse, refuse. And she had posted in a Facebook group saying, hey, looking for a second. I reached out and I was just like, hey, I've I've never shot a wedding. I do portraits. Here's my portrait work. And she's like, I love it. It's like, come with me next week. So I was like, okay. And then, um, she said, shoot the groom how you would shoot any other portraits. And after that, she was just like, have fun, get creative. And she just let me go do my thing. And so ever since then, it's kind of been, I don't want to have your cookie cutter pictures. Like, 
understand some people want them, but like I want something that's going to be fun and like you can look back on 20, 30 years and be like, we actually had a blast during our wedding day. We weren't off taking porches for two hours and like yeah. not hanging out with our friends and family and like enjoying the bar we paid for or eating the food we paid for. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I want people to actually enjoy their wedding day and be present, not just like, oh, I'm running through these steps for Instagram or Pinterest likes. And oh, so. geez. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, dude, I I, uh, I find that your work speaks to me on a lot of levels because I think you have tons of creative diversity, um, whether it's a wedding shoot, whether it's portrait shoot. There, it's easy for me to pick up like a, a slim snap photo and know like, oh shit, that was that was James. You know what I'm saying? Like Thank you yeah. have a, you've developed a style and a look and feel that no matter the subject matter, it feels like one of your photos. And for me, you know, I've only been taking pictures for like three years now. Well, you know, like two and a half, three years now. And I feel like that's my biggest struggle right now, like figuring out who I am as an artist. But to some degree, I think that's something that I'll struggle with forever. Um, but in your own personal experience, what was that like sort of developing your style, developing your your flair and sort of just developing your your look and feel that has, in my opinion, come very synonymous with with your work as a photographer? Honestly, I feel like I have it. <laughs> I mean, like, truthfully, I, I feel like oh, I shit. <laughs> Yeah, like I... Because I feel like I'm constantly switching, switching things up. So, I mean, I can't pick up to me, like, to me, like, I, if I saw my feed, I mean, my work on the, on the feed, I personally wouldn't be able to pick it up if I knew I didn't edit that picture. Mm. So for me, it's still like, I feel like I'm still trying to hone it in. Whereas like you say, you notice that I myself can't. <laughs> That's very interesting. That's fucking really interesting. Cause like, yeah. dude, no matter where I'm scrolling, like threads or Instagram or whatever, like I'll stop and I'll know that it's your shit. And that's fucking funny. <laughs> that's funny to me. I mean, that's pretty wild. Yeah. yeah like, I mean, truthfully, like, I, I really, I can't like, it's like for me, it's like, it's, it's still hard to nail down. So like, I'm still trying to, I feel like I'm still trying to find like my, like my style, like, you know, like how say Lebowitz or any of those people where like, even like parks, like they have, like they're very distinctive. And I feel like mine's not quite there yet. Like, I feel like I'm starting to get there with like some of my, the poses I capture, like, you know, always like the hands and stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. that's kind of synonymous with me but then like when it comes to color grading i feel like it's it's everywhere like there's no, there's no... oh man dude i change on <laughs> such a frequent basis it's like i don't know i have like one style that i'm really obsessed with and everybody hates it but i fucking love it so like am i wrong or is everybody else wrong <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, i'll say what what style is it so i like crushing the blacks i like a really muted image and i like uh, that sort of desaturated um low contrast kind of vibe and everyone hates like i literally had a buddy of mine be like dude do you do this on purpose or like is this like are you messing up something in lightroom and i'm like well i mean yeah i, I have been doing it this <laughs> like you may not think so but it's intentional <laughs> i mean have you seen um excuse me have you seen brian schumann's work no no i'm so not if familiar you look at his work like what you just like said reminds me a lot of his work okay he does like he shoots on large format and does kind of documentary style you know, portraits and environmental portraits. Like, like Brian Burks is like, that's who like one of his big influences, like that line. It's very, very low contrast, like overall low contrast, but then like the blacks are crushed, but there's still like a lot of depth in the colors overall. Mm -hmm. So I think like, I mean, he has stuff all over the world. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, maybe I'm not wrong. Much. <laughs> I was like, I want to get to heart too much. So you're saying there's a chance, James. <laughs> I mean, I, just, just, just a little slow. <laughs> no, I'm with you, though, on slowing down my process because I think that's one of the things I've gotten a lot better with over time. Because, like, when I first started, dude, I would come out of, like, a test shoot with a model and I would have, like, 1,500 photos. And I'd be like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what are you doing? I have six photos in a row that are the same photo. Why am I doing this to myself? My computer was even telling me, bro, this is the same photo. Do you want to import all of these? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I want to import all these. They're not the same. You know what I mean? Um, talk to me about how that process works for you in terms of slowing down, being more conscious, and like sort of being more present in, in the shoots in the moment. So a lot of it was, like you said, I didn't want to sort. <laughs> I hate sorting through. And so, I mean, even now it's like, um, say I shoot a wedding that's six hours, six hour wedding. Some people are delivering, you know, 70 to 100 photos per, like, hour. Whew. And I'm maybe, like, at 30. Like, maybe. And a lot of them, are, to me, are keepers. Like, there won't be a lot that are missed. It's just, I feel like it's repetitive moments. And I don't want to, I feel like there's no need to shoot that much. I agree. Because, like, yeah, I mean, like, if you, 
if you capture a scene, there's no need to go back and re like reshoot the scene unless you're changing lenses or like you know getting a different vintage or a different viewpoint. So it's like one of those things I've like had to catch myself of. I don't know what artist says, but like, I'm only going to take one picture of this scene, and like once that picture is taken, then it's done. I'm not going to reshoot it. So like it's basically a one and done. I'm not quite there yet, but like I might, it might be three frames, and then I'm on to the next. And it's just trying to catch myself because like. If like the more time you spend in that one moment or that frame, you're missing everything else around you. So like, oh. I'm shooting you right now. There could be something that happened over here to the left or the right, but I'm so focused right here. I'm missing everything else around me. Yeah. I like, try not. Yeah, I try to be aware, but like, so I could, I'm not missing, say, possibly a like, dad taking a picture or like if I'm with the model, and we have like the you know the window open over here. Like, hey, if it's natural light and that slight shift of the sun might make the biggest difference, but I'm a focus here i'm not going to notice that's coming through so it's trying to be like aware of the surroundings and not so focused just on that instant moment that i can catch the changes you know yeah i like that i think that's a big struggle for me right now and it's one of the things that i work with on a lot on like when i'm in studio like don't shoot 500 600 photos like move on there's you know i don't need 20 of the same pose i need five you know it's like yeah. if you're in the same position if you're in the same sort of area the light's hitting the same way if you're not shooting you know what i mean like move on and I, it's just like partially it's still the excitement of this all sort of being new like i've only been doing it for a few years and just like pinch me i'm here i'm doing it it's fucking great <laughs> and then partially it's like well i just want to make sure i get it you know i'm not fucking <laughs> this up so it's like you know it's like imposter syndrome slash just happy to be here slash ignorance that it's just like all facilitating through but it's something that i work on a lot i think i would assume a lot of people have that problem for sure but i mean when you're when there's money in the line and like say somebody's brand is all like you know you're depicting that brand and creating the, the images for their brand then like don't want to fuck sure, it up <laughs> yeah you want to make sure you know those shots so like if i'm doing like some fashion work for a brand like i'm going to try to make sure like I might overshoot them because I want to give them as many possibility, like as many options as possible. Yeah. You know, what's funny, man. I, uh, I have a very much documentary style to my photography. I kind of started doing street photography before I became working in it. You know, I was like a nine to five kind of thing. And that aspect of my photography, I think is what draws people to hiring me from brand work, from fashion work, from whatever I'm doing, m music, et cetera, because of the way that I, sort of like come at it from a street photographer's perspective but most of my favorite photos that i shoot end up being on film end up being either on 35 millimeter or medium format because number one the process is super fucking slow number two i think there's a lot more intention into what i'm doing in that moment because it's fucking 76 dollars per shot <laughs> and, and number three i just like i think i prefer it honestly like if money was no object i would shoot strictly film all the time when you're working you have a workflow that I think is probably pretty unique to other wedding photographers, uh, for sure. High level of film shot, rangefinder, digital, which is probably uncommon in the well, less becoming more common in the field. Um, so when you're like going to put like your shot list together and your equipment list together for whether it's a wedding or a branch or whatever, what are you thinking about when you're packing your bag? Oof, I'm trying to think. I have my you know I have my go to lenses, so like I. Right now, my my bag is basically my SL two is out at service. Oh <laughs> so damn! That's that's out. It'll I think it'll be back the second week of February. Um, but really, I have my M eleven, which is like the main body, and usually I have my forty on there. So like I, that's my go to lens. Ooh, Voigtlander forty. Like, yep, yeah, forty one two. So like that's my go to every time, and then I have the Nikon ZF. Oh cool! It's, it's, that's like my backup, and I have like the. The tech art adapter that um you know can I can autofocus with the M lenses. And so I'll, you know, I'll do have a range, but really I have usually a 21 Voigtlander for some funky stuff, my 40, which is like my go-to, and then either a 75 or 90. And that's basically like I have that across like any anybody. Mm -hmm. So even with the um the ZF, I have a 20 and a 40. <laughs> and so like that I have my have my go-to set you know for what is part. it about 40 that's such a unique focal length to be 
used on two different systems. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know, like, okay. Like having a 40 on an M base, fine. Like it's a, it's, it's a cool lens. I've, I've, I've seen it before. Like it's not an, you know, it's like the Helios 44. It's like, people love that lens. I get that. But to have a 40 on two different, that's interesting. Tell me about that. So, so for me, I think like 50 is just slightly too tight, even though mm-hmm. I love 50. Like I feel like I had the 50, um, Sumicron, like V4. And I was like, just a smidge too tight. So I'm like, all right, I need something just a hair wider. And like when I was on, I had my first Nikon F100, I had a 40. And then when I got my first rangefinder, it was a Bessa, like R3 or whatever, I got a 40. And every time I get 35 or 50, and I would just, like, I just, it didn't, I didn't jive with it. I've tried hmm. and tried, I've, I've got multiple 35s, multiple 50s, and every time I go back to 40. So it's like, same thing with 35 for me. Like, 35 is, just comparably too tight compared to 28. Yeah. And so like, if I, how you, like you said, you shoot street and stuff for me, like if I'm doing like more documentary stuff, or whatever. It's like, it just feels too tight compared to 28. So it's like, if I need to, I can crop it a little bit or just take a step forward. You know, it's um, funny. So. so my, like my first setup when I like lost my job and like I spent money on a camera, I bought an M6 and a 35 millimeter Sumicron and I shot thousands of photos through that camera. And then, you know, it was like the middle of the pandemic. I decided I was going to be a photographer. I got, had to buy a digital camera. So I sold it so I could buy a digital camera because I was like, I need to work, right? Yeah. So I got rid of it. And then last year when I was like, I'm ready to reinvest in, in a Leica M film camera, I bought the MP. But I went with the 50 Sumalux. And I think 50 for me, even in street, even in documentary type situations, the tightness, I think, adds more more gravity, more uh, sort of like heightened experience to the frame that 35 just felt a little bit wider. And like, I think I was losing too much in, in the, in the scope of the frame because I was either not close enough or too far, or it just wasn't, I wasn't shooting it the way you should. And I found that 50 is like my fucking jam and I'm, I'm rocking <laughs> this. Cause when I put that 50 on my SL two S I make magic just period. <laughs> it's just true. It's just like, it's my dream setup. It's like everything that I want. It's so fucking good for portraits. It's like everything that I want. But like when I'm going through what I want kit wise, I need to start, like we've been talking about the M11 for a while and I know you've been having a rough <laughs> couple of weeks with it, but like I want one and I don't yeah. know, like I'm, I'm sort of in this weird place right now because I think I'm close enough towards uh, the SL3. I'm close enough to maybe the new Hasselblad. And I just don't know what I want. And I, like, you know, I don't have 50,000 subscribers at these brands that just start tossing me shit to try. You know what I mean? So it's not yeah. like, you know, it's, it's tough, but I do find it super interesting that you found 40 to be like a very you focal length across multiple systems. I think that's kind of cool. I, I like that. Yeah. I mean, and even like with the, I'm trying to think, um, I would say, honestly, rent, rent the M11, like the M, like going from the M10R to the M11, I still like the M10R sensor better. Like, Ooh. Yeah, it's... Really? Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's... I don't know. It renders similar to the SL2 for me. And so I think that was the thing. Like, I love I love my Q2 and the SL2. Like, when I had the Q2, same mm-hmm. sensor. And the M10R to me was very similar. And something with the M11, like, I've tried it in Lightroom and Capture One. And something is just, like, slightly... It feels slightly off. So I don't know if it's, like, the camera profile or something, but... Hmm. If you get the perfect light with it, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's yeah, like it's gorgeous. Yeah. Sure, or like perfect. Or if you should do strobes, then like <laughs> you know, great. But I mean, the SL, the the SL three. I'm looking forward to that possibly. Yeah. And I, then the, I, to be honest with you, like I know they're going to end up putting a flippy screen on it, which I don't want, and I know it'll have the 63 megapixel sensor, which I'm I'm here for, and it's it's like an easy. I have the SL2S. I'm. I don't think I'll ever get rid of it because I. I love the video aspect of that camera. It's. It really is the best hybrid camera I think I've ever used. Um, I. I don't know. It's. You know. I'm. I'm fucking. What first world <laughs> problems, right? But it's like I just don't know what I want to do. I just really don't. And that's okay. Like I think yeah. you can make decisions from a gear perspective that makes sense today that may not make sense six months from now. And like these things change. And like when you buy good things and good quality and good brands, you retain enough value where you can get in and out of stuff and not get absolutely whacked on it. Um, yeah. At least you, you got to hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I got, I got out of my X1 D2 
I, I can't I came out maybe losing like 50 bucks after buying wow. matters. So I mean I had for a while I had the X1D2, the 63, the 45, and like four or five batteries. And just for a wedding day, I just that's so had a beefy. Couple yeah, well, it wasn't even beefy. It, honestly, it probably weighed the same as the M11. Oh, like it the M11s kind of they're beefy, the are, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, they're beefy. So the X1D2, like it really it was great, um, for portraits and stuff. It was just I had a couple freezes, just like oh. I'm having with M11. And um, Not I don't great. know if it was the Arizona heat. Like at the time, it was midsummer. It was like a hundred degrees outside. Yeah, that'll do it. And it just froze up. And then one time it was sensors overheating, so I had that. But then um, not being able to edit and capture one is what killed it for the X system for me because I I do love the X system a lot. Yeah, I don't blame you. I mean, I shot the R5 for probably 2020, 2021. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when did I buy the Leica last year? Twenty two. When did the SL2S come out? Yeah. So I had, I had the R5 for two years, and then I went to the Leica, and I don't regret it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, Canon makes great glass, great great cameras. I I had no problems with the R5. Just that I shot the 28 to 70 F2, and the thing weighed 50,000 pounds. And I was so like, what, what, and, what prompted the switch? I was going to ask you, because I remember we talked about, like, you know, you get rid of the R5, possibly going to the SL series. So, so for me, uh, I've always... I know this is such like a cop out. I find the navigation system in the menu system of the Leica to be such a breeze that I'm never in studio. And I'm like, fuck, I can't find this fucking thing that I need. Like that was one thing that I always felt like I was like having problems finding. Right. So stupid. Um, and not like a real pain point. Right. Just something that was like in the back of my mind. The reason why I switched because I bought the MP, which was always my dream camera. Uh, I don't, Unless film prices go th- to like a billion dollars a roll, I'll probably never get rid of that camera. Yeah. And to me, when you invest, you know, ten plus thousand dollars into a setup, <laughs> that lens needs to be able to be used elsewhere. And to me, it seemed to make more sense to adapt it to like a digital body versus a Canon digital body. And yeah. like it was doing the sale, fifteen hundred bucks back for the SL two SL two S kit. And I was like, that's a pretty good deal. It's basically what I would have was in for my Canon system for. So I was able to get out of the Canon system and into the Leica system. I think it cost me like 400 bucks difference between the two. And, you know, literally the price was mostly just the extra batteries in that device. (laughs) Those fucking SL2 batteries are just absurd, Um, which is just like egregious. And don't get me started. I'll I'll talk for a fucking hour about (laughs) these goddamn batteries. Um but to me, like I like the simplicity. I like the like colors. I like everything about the SL2S from a form factor perspective. It feels premium in a way that the R5 didn't. Like I feel yeah. like I've got a five thousand dollar camera in my hand versus the Canon always felt like a little bit of a toy. It's much more plasticky. Yeah. And when I bought the MP, it just seemed like it coincided perfectly with that sale that they were doing. Uh and I was like, oh, yeah duh and i did it and i'm not i don't i'm extreme i've I've put thousands of photos through my sl2s i'm doing a lot more video with it which i'm really enjoying um shout out ben rizzo we're shooting a little mini doc tomorrow which i'm super excited about um so yeah i mean i i think it's the perfect hybrid camera and i'm not getting paid i'm not this is not endorsed by like <laughs> um and i just love it and i think that the bump down sensor to 24 makes it a low light beast i shoot so much music stuff and i've shot that thing at fucking i've definitely shot it at twenty five thousand iso and been able to pull out a lot of the grain in post and the photos are usable and they don't look bad so yeah, yeah. that to me was the the decision and i don't regret it at all and you know the internet fucking threads will talk shit about every like a camera ever made and I, I just don't think people get the opportunity to play with them. If you had a couple days a week with the camera, you'd be like, this is a, an enjoyable experience. It makes me want to create, makes me want to pick up and go do it. And I never had that experience with Canon. And shout out to Leica. They have a photographer in mind when they create their gear. And it makes me want to go create. I never had that feeling when I shot Canon. And that's a nice feeling. I th- and I think I truly think people underestimate the whole menu system debacle because like it's it's frustrating like i mean yeah. 
like the best menu system ever used was the Hostel Blood, and then right behind is the Leica. And like yeah. they're very, but they're very similar setup. They're like they're very minimalist, you know, mm-hmm. four or five buttons. So I picked up the S5 II as a backup for the L mount, and I couldn't do it. It was too mm. many buttons. I'm like, there's like so many buttons on this thing. I know. And I'm like, it's I intimidating. Get, like, it's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. It's a very popular camera too. Like very popular. Yeah, like, it was cool. Like it was great for low light, but I was like, if I, if I need something low light, I'll pick up the SL2S. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't, I'm not shooting live music really anymore. So I mean, I don't have the, the low light needs as much, but the SL2S has definitely been on the radar just for that. I mean, like even for wedding days, like I don't always need. 50 megapixels. I yeah. really don't. I, yeah. That's my dilemma right now, honestly, because like in terms of next system, because I think two digital bodies is sort of the sweet spot. And I think most of my shooting, whether it's brand related or concert related is SL2S and the MP. Um, and I don't, I don't know how much I think film it's so personal for me and it's what I want to shoot all the time but i'm not actually getting paid to shoot film right like it's yeah that's a hobbyist mentality for why i take it out so like to me whether i pick up an m11 or another sl body or potentially a hasselblad digital camera like the <sighs> i need two digital bodies and that's sort of where my struggle is right now and what they are i don't have to make a yeah. decision like there's no timeline like it's it's few and far between where I need to rock two bodies because most of the mm-hmm. stuff is most of my work's in studio or, you know, environmental, et cetera. So I can get away with shooting my film when I want and shooting my digital when I want. And I don't have to worry about, Ooh, I got to switch. Cause I don't have the right lens or, you know, or the process yeah. of it all. And then like, dude, the other thing that I've thought a lot about is like picking up a cue. Like I like the cue a lot and I, and the Q three is a fucking beast. So you can get away with so much with that camera that like almost takes away from the need for a digital M body. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Cause like I can do whatever the fuck I want. I can get whatever I want, Yeah, but like, <laughs> I don't want to just spend money just, just because just, like you just I, have, spend, yeah. I have zero dependents. Like there's no kids running around here. Like I don't, I don't <laughs> have to worry about a college fund. You know what I mean? Like I can go buy whatever the fuck I want, but that doesn't mean I need to go buy whatever the fuck yeah. I want. It's like, just not, it's like, that's a consumer mentality. I just don't have it anymore. I'm old. I'm old. Yeah, you know I mean, I don't give a shit like that anymore. So it's just like for me, it's like figuring out the process and what fits into that workflow. I just, you know, I, you know, I'm torn right now. Yeah, especially I when mean, you tell Q- me that like the M11's <laughs> fucking bricking on you. Yeah, I mean, also the Q, like, I tell people all the time, I miss my Q2. Like, only yeah. I mostly got the M11 was for the internal storage. Mm, yeah, it's a great, and, great thing. And the Q3 didn't do it. That's why I was like. That's why I got the M11 over it because I was like, you know, like, if I'm shooting with somebody else, like shooting for somebody, I can go home with the pictures on the right from my laptop. Mm-hmm. Like, the Q2, a lot of the wedding days, I would use it a ton. Like that thing in studio, honestly, like is one of my favorite cameras in studio. Oh, interesting. It's not great in studio because like the leaf shutter. Yeah. So it's just like running like the, the Hasselblad system. So, I mean, you can yeah. basically black out a full lit studio and be good to go. And so like that's you know, cool. getting funky with it and like, you have like a little the little Q pixie flash or whatever or a small like even like a hundred watt pro photo mm-hmm. and you can you can get as funky as you want with it and not you know not have yeah, the restrictions. Cool. I never even thought about that, honestly. It does it doesn't come up much in my workflow, but that would be fun. I don't know. Now see like now my fucking see James, <laughs> do you see what happens to me? I have like gear acquisition ADHD. And it's a good thing that I have a ton of resolve and like I'm not fucking oh hey credit card boom you know it's like if i was like that i would have what's the meme i am massively in debt or whatever like you know which is good i'm growing with age i'm very proud of myself <laughs> but dude honestly like if it, if it was like economically feasible i would shoot everything on film i think when i was like i was going through old journals that i found recently and i found something when i started right before I went on my, I went on a cross country trip when I lost my job and took a million photos and fell in love with photography. And that's why I do it now. But I found a, a shoebox full of my grandfather's old Kodachrome slides, like hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I never met gra- my grandfather. He died before I was born. And that sort of connection to him and then also to photography started before I bought a camera. And my affinity for film has now you know, carried over because of that. Um, Do you have a similar feeling? Like if it was economic, if it was, I mean, it is reliable. I, I, God, I'm not going to say this. I've never had a problem with film, 
You know what I'm saying? It's like, what are, what are your feelings? Because I, like, I think you have the great sort of dual flow of digital versus film. But like, I don't know if you're like me. And it's just like, I would like to shoot film all the time. I mean, I like to, and I do. It's not always economic yeah. friendly. Yeah. Um, like right now, I actually was sorting out if I can, if you can see it. So that's all I was sorting Holy everything out. Holy shit. So that's where I'm at right now with um, development. So I think it's 31 rolls <laughs> of 120. And Jeez. then I'm trying to think. Probably 15 rolls of 35. Oh so man! That's everything's loaded. Um, so it's not always economic friendly, and then I have I have a bunch of four by five in the. Sorry, my dogs are going off. It's okay. I have a bunch of, have a bunch of four by five in the bathroom. Oh, cool. To develop as well, so I, it's not always economic friendly, but it's. I love the process enough to where like, I'll find a way to do it. Um, so I mean, even if I'm doing a sh- like I'm working on a personal project covering different artists um, throughout the valley and stuff and. That's basically just me just eating the cost, you know. They're not paying me anything. They're not chipping any costs. Yeah. It's basically just me just passion project. So every time, you know, it's probably four or five rolls of film, four or five sheets of four by five plus whatever thirty five. So you know, it's a couple hundred bucks each person. Yeah, and it's just it adds sunk up cost. Yes, yes, yeah, sunk cost. But then I'm like also like thinking at it too, like to get the quality I'm getting from like my four by five or like my hustle blood like 500 I have to buy like a phase one and that's like 30k is yeah, the way fuck, i look at it fuck phase one that's <laughs> so, just so like so it's like 30k so it's like all right i can keep that's a doing lot of this. films <laughs> yeah yeah so it's a and i have a fridge full of films so it's like all right i haven't quite spent thirty thousand dollars on film yet so i'm good for now yeah so I, think, I have i think four or five rolls of 35 millimeter left and then probably like 15 or 16 boxes of 120 so what I want to do is shoot it all, whatever's left this year, and not replace it until it's all gone, and then make my decisions on what I'm going to do with my life. <laughs> so at least like I have a couple months to think about it, like because dude, to, uh, to be honest with you, like I would love everyone to hire me and pay me because I shoot film, and like that's a pipe dream because you know I'm, I'm not that good, but <laughs> it's just, like that's the dream, but like. I've gotten so deep into Polaroid lately and it's like the thing that inspires me to go create again. And I'm dude, I'm, I email Polaroid once a week asking them about eight by 10 Polaroids. And they're probably like, dude, stop hitting up our generic fucking <laughs> ask a question line. We will let you know when they're restocked. But that's my next jump of what I want to do. I want to buy an eight by 10 camera. It's like fucking five grand or whatever. That's without a lens. Now you got to buy a lens and I want to shoot eight by 10 Polaroids. Cause I think that will be fucking awesome and <laughs> expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, to me, if I could like, listen, you know, that's that presupposes that I don't go viral and get 500,000 Instagram followers in the next seven minutes. Um, <laughs> but Ideally, my entire workflow would be film. I, I, I feel a connection to it in a way that I don't with digital. And it is the intent behind it. And the most morbid, honest to God truth of it is, James is like, dude, when I die, all my fucking cloud gets wiped. Everything I ever did is gone. But like my negatives will exist. And like, you know, I'm not going to have kids, but like maybe my nieces or my nephews or their kids or whatever, like maybe that shit sticks around for some time. And it's a thing. It's like a physical yeah. thing that I was here and I did it. And I, I think about that a lot. I know it's super morbid, but I do, I do. It's real though. Like, I mean, we t- like I talk about with people like, um, with, like, it's about photography in general, you know, it's, I was at a conference and, or like, in a, like a workshop and I was telling people either, like, you know, why, why photography, like asking about my mindset and stuff. I'm like, well, I was like, you think about it, like, when you get older, your body starts to go and stuff. And like, kind of all you have left are memories and then mm. when memories start to go all you have left are pictures to kind of like spark those memories so like it's morbid to think about but it's real i know and, dude and i know so it's, so it's one of the things that we're like said all my negatives are just in a corner it's like i pray our house doesn't like catch fire or anything because like all yeah. that's gone but yeah. it's even with the couples like couples like i'll send them their negatives and like put these away like keep them safe because like if you ever want to get 
darker prints done, hand them off to your kids, anything else, like you lose the flash drive, at least you still have all these negatives from yeah. your wedding day or like or a family event. I was like, if you have a disposable camera, get your negatives back. <laughs> Dude, like, some guy on uh TikTok or Instagram or something went viral. He hands out disposables to people at like events and stuff. Fucking coolest thing ever. I don't know, have you seen those videos? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm obsessed with that. I think that's really cool. And it just goes back to the tactile, like physical. There's something there with film that you don't get with digital. And it's no wonder why so many people fucking edit their digital photos to look like film because it's better. It is better. <laughs> Come yeah, at me in the that's comments, bro. <laughs> that's what I've been doing recently is um, I bought the, the Leica Sofort too. So basically the Leica oh, cool. Instax or whatever, Instax Mini. And Basically, every shoot now, it's like I will send pictures off the M11 over to it, and then the model with a couple of whoever leaves with a couple Instax. Oh, just take cool. Them instantly. That's so, how the like, quality is so good, man. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, so you can send it from directly from the like, camera phone, like the like a the like a photos, photos app. app. So that's yeah. the biggest. That's why I went with the. I had the Instax in my cart for honestly like two years. Yeah. And I broke my sex. Don't buy it. It sucks. <laughs> well, good move not buying it. <laughs> but yeah, so like it's been sitting there, and then finally, like they came out with that. I'm like, this is genius. Like, just the whole how they did their whole ecosystem. They kind of took the Apple approach, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing, but it's, it's not a bad thing, honestly. And that's no. why like people fucking shit on Leica and shit on rangefinders and shit on everything that they have. But like, they're very intent and very conscious about everything working together, and that's super important. I don't have to like worry about not knowing something and figuring it out because I've got the experience on one of their other products. Yeah. I, man, I fucking love that shit. That's cool. <laughs> Damn, man. Listen, so, yes. I, I, I bought a very expensive uh, old Polaroid camera, that Brooklyn Film Camera Lab, whatever the company's name is, updates with the internal 600 speed for the Polaroid 600 film. Mm -hmm. I think it was like four or 500 bucks. I don't care. It was worth every fucking dollar. It's amazing. And I'm obsessed with it. And it's got no electronics, right? It's yeah, it has no electronics and it's, it's fantastic. Like I'll never buy another pull. Uh, I don't know that I two seems kind of cool. I was, I was going to say, have, have you, have you played with the I two? No, no, no. It looks sick though. I haven't played with it. So I, a friend of mine, the name is uh, Rachel, like RK artistry. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's on my page. Um, they shot myself and another model. So there's two guys in the studio where we did a we did like a streetwear look and then an all black look. And they shot all film and then um I, I think a decent amount of Polaroids, but we did some double exposures with Polaroids. Ooh. And then we found out I was like playing with my flash stuff. They have a two point five millimeter um jack, so you can actually sync flash to it as well. So you can shoot flash in studio. We found out. So, um, yeah, it is. Yeah, you can do. I think Ooh. you can do like like four plus like exposures on one sheet. So you can get like really. You can get really funky with it. So oh, that's cool. It's definitely worth looking into if you're if you. Six hundred dollars though. But they're already selling used for like four hundred. Oh wow, that was quick. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I saw. I saw them. I think it was on Reddit. I saw a guy selling it for like, like I think four fifty with shipping and PayPal fees. I'm like. That's pretty good. That's pretty so, good. I mean, and it came with film, and you can use. I think you can use six hundred, and, and the I type. Yeah, and yeah, and I type. Yeah, interesting. Ooh, dude. Oh man, shit. That's cool. Yeah. I so, uh, yeah. I've got three Polaroid cameras. Don't ask me why. I got one as a gift. I bought one, and then I bought the expensive one, uh, the SX seventy. <clears throat> it's new. It's weird calling it an SX seventy because it's brand new. Um, yeah. But randomly, like I was shooting one, I had a bunch of boxes of iType that I can't shoot on the SX70. And I was in studio and it was setting off the flashes, which was super weird. Just not connected to anything, just shooting it. And it ruined all of the fucking photos because it was like, I was like, why is this happening? Like, I'm not doing this. It's just doing it by itself. And I was like, I, had, I have no control. I, I can't control the exposure. It's just a button. It's auto exposure. It's just like. It was all whitewashed. It was terrible. I was like, man, what the fuck, Polaroid? Like, I didn't ask for this. Like, come on, man. Just give me my fucking eight by ten and let me live. <laughs> talk yeah, to me absolutely. about I was like, talk to me about shooting four by five because my buddy Dean was trying to tell me that I should shoot that before I get into eight by ten. Um, my whole caveat with all of this is like I don't want to develop any of my own film. I don't, I won't, and mm -hmm. I don't want to. 
So is that a huge problem with shooting four by five and eight by ten? Uh, I think eight by ten more so than four by five. I haven't All tried right. eight by ten. Yeah, I thought about picking one up, but then very, so it's, it's yeah, so expensive. And I mean, some people shoot paper as negative, so I mean that's yeah. another option. It's a little cheaper, but for me, I um I have the the Stearman press tank, so it's four sheets, and then I bought a tank. Um, it's an adapter, basically goes in a Peterson tank or Patterson mm-hmm. tank, and it does six sheets. It's I think it's, if you look at bees. Beast cameras or like Burgett's cameras. He's actually out of the East Coast. He's a watch. He did, he makes custom watches, but he also does stuff through the praying for cameras. And um, oh wow, that's made it a lot easier. Initially, I was scanning on the V550 and I would stitch two images together. Oh before, shit! <laughs> before I was scanning with my SL2, but um, there's been a couple times I've sent stuff out, so I'll send it out to Northeast Photographic in Maine. And they've scanned stuff or developed a scan for me, um, but yeah, really, I just I really do it all myself. I mean, what this, do you ship? What point, would you ship it in the negative to? So like, I would basically. I, so it's like, I guess like here we go. This, yeah, so this is like two scans, my two scan box. So like, you know, it comes in the box, and then in the box there's like a it comes in an envelope, and then it's like dual. It has a there we go. Has like another box and then it has like an envelope in it so basically i'll put With it the back film. in the um, yeah i'd put so it in back the dark in the envelope. bag in the dark yeah. bag you stick it back ah, i got gotcha. you yeah you put it in the envelope the dark, dark bag and then there and then i just ship basically yeah, when i ship it i just write like you know to develop on there there we go to develop gotcha. and then what it has mm-hmm. and then like if i have anything to push or anything anything else you know i'll have it on there and i just tape the box up and send it to them and then they'll Sweet. that's not yeah, that's a, not that hard i bet i could do the same thing with eight by ten I mean, you, you can, yeah. Like, I think, I think Northeast Photographic does eight by ten, and they, they, yeah, they, they do drum scans as well. They like they, they do drum scans. If you like for black and white, they do five ten pyro, which Ooh. is awesome. Um, if you don't want to develop it yourself, so I mean, they do a lot. I don't of want to do any there. development. I live in a four hundred fifty yeah. square foot studio. I don't have space <laughs> to do. People are like, oh, why you're not real film photographer. You Fuck you. Okay, I live in twelve feet. Where would you like me to keep all these chemicals, all this shit? I live in four hundred square feet. I don't have the space. Don't tell me anything. I I shoot thousands of fucking rolls of film. I shoot film. I don't need to develop myself. It's such my. It's my biggest hot take. Shut the fuck up. Let me live. Let me live. Sorry, I, mean, I digress. You're, you're, you're not far from Maine either, though. So I mean, for you, it, yeah. it might get there. It get there today. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. That's not bad. So that's so that's an option too, and the prices aren't bad. The scans are great. So I mean, yeah, it's something to look into. Yeah, especially if you don't want to. Yeah. My my next thing is like I'm either gonna go full into digital and like buy the X2D 100C or the 907 CF 100C, whatever or uh go heavier into film and buy an eight by ten i i think i'm gonna just bypass four by five because they don't make four by five polaroids and i think they oh they do uh, it's not on their website no well, not anymore but i mean uh, you still can buy them oh, I, right, right. I, yes I, I have some i just oh, haven't, sick. Haven't, shot, haven't shot any yet because i have like a bunch of fp 100c oh god that, Yes, I'd... <laughs> i've shot one box in my life it was the best experience of my entire life it was fucking amazing <laughs> I, th- I think I shot three packs. One pack was like half busted, but I got in right around COVID. People mm-hmm. were clearing out stock, hard for money, and so I just scooped up a bunch of packs. <laughs> Honestly, I'm truly shocked that someone doesn't see the vast financial potential in remanufacturing this. I know it's like a chemical thing, and some of the stuff doesn't exist anymore. The manufacturing process doesn't exist anymore. I get that. We live in 2023, 2024, excuse me. You can 3D print anything in your house. I think smart people could fucking make a machine to make this stuff. Like, it's try- possible. Did you, I'm trying to think where it was, it, I think it was last week or week before. They, um, somebody made a kit, a Polaroid kit, and they, you have to do, you basically, it's like almost, you're making it yourself. So they have the chemicals and stuff and you coat it. And you only can do what, one sheet at a time. So it's not like a pack. It's like hmm. individual sheets. I saw someone do it with like 20 by 40 or 40 by six, like massive Polaroids. Brooklyn mm-hmm. film camera did it. I don't know if you saw that, that yeah. I've seen, I've not seen smaller. It's yeah. It's, it's like the size of the FP 100 C. If I find it, I'll send it to you, but like it, they recently did it and they put out kits for it. It's just, it's more expensive than buying an FP 100 C. 
Oh, not doing it's, that. It's and more yeah, work. <laughs> yeah, it's like and more work. So you have to do it yourself. So I'm like, so I could mess up the coding, and I have to do it, put it in yeah. this, the dark. Yeah, it's like this seems. No, no, no. That yeah. sounds too complicated. I am yeah, not a DIY it's... guy. I'm a. I want this to be somewhat idiot proof, and I don't want to fuck <laughs> it up. Because, dude, if you spend, I mean, listen, the boxes are still around 100, 125 bucks for a box of FP100C. If you're spending more than that, and it, yeah, and I, there's a high probability that I'm going to fuck it up, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. Why would I do that? Yeah. It's a, a terrible like, economic decision. <laughs> I, think it's like 80, I think it's like 85 bucks for a five pack. Ooh, I'm like, that's insane. That's like, a lot. Yeah. And you have to do it all yourself. Yeah. It's a, yeah and it, yeah, there's an the aspect of possibly screwing up something. That likelihood would be high for me, for sure. <laughs> that this seems very very likely but i think what's cool is like dude i've only been doing this for a few years but like my desire to try new things is always always increasing like on a daily weekly basis i want to try new positions new poses new models new ideas new places new gear everything and i think that's what's cool about a creative life that i never experienced before this um what still inspires you to like create on like a life basis <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, really experimentation, like experimentation and then like the conversation that comes with it. So, I mean, now it's, if I'm doing, doing TFB or something or testing, you know, the pictures are cool. And like, it's not, like, if it's not a paid client, then it's basically an experiment. I look at yeah. like that, it's an experiment. So, I mean, I'm going to try out something different most likely and probably take that, that uh, experience I get from that into a client base or to, into a client shoot. but. Really, if all it comes from it is like a good conversation and like learning something from the person or the shoot, then like I'm good. I love Cause that. Because then, like, because I mean, like I said, the, when it comes to client work, there's a whole different aspect. But if it's not, if it's not paid work or not even, or if it's should say, if it's not branding work for somebody that has a very specific vision, then mm -hmm. you know it's 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 fair game. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm with you. Um how do you what are your like feelings on failure um I, I i feel like i failed miserably coming into this creative life i spent the first 12 to 24 ish months drowning like terribly and i've just now three and a half years almost to the day feel like i've got my head above water and i'm fucking cranking and i feel good about it but i failed a lot to kind of get to this point of time um what is your own personal relationship like with failure a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, I would say I think la I think it was last year, probably for a good portion of the year, I felt like every wedding that I shot second or lead on, the work was trash. Oh, whether it was or not, like the other people might not have thought it was, but I personally felt like it was. So like I feel like I felt that couple or felt myself because I didn't create images up to the level I wanted to, and so it, it took a lot of reframing and. I took a step back for a minute of no shoots or like very minimal shoots or anything really photography wise. I would just honestly, sometimes I'd go out drive and wouldn't take any pictures. Um, Love that. But yeah. That was like a, a big part of trying to reframe that it's okay. Like, it's okay to fail. And then like what I think is it might, might be pretty or might, my to my expectations isn't what other people see. Like, yeah. You know, earlier you were saying that you can like spot my picture in a feed where it's like, I can't. <laughs> That's and super so interesting just, to me. That blew my mind, so, honestly. So like, you know, it's like that things that were like, you know, like my, my thought and vision isn't what other people see. And like, I've, I've come to realize that more and more. My wife like is trying to help me with that too. Of like, she's like, you're great at this. You're really good at this. Like you just need to accept it and like try to see it from a different perspective. Cause like what you see isn't what everybody else is seeing currently. Totally. Um, so that's that big, is yeah. that is uh, imposter syndrome. I'm acutely aware <laughs> of it. Uh, I, it's funny because, like, dude, it's this goes back to like shout out to my old therapist because like he definitely helped me a lot. I have like this reverse body dysmorphia thing where I think I look really good and I don't. So I think similarly from a life perspective, <laughs> I think I'm a lot better confidence wise than like maybe I am. Um, but my relationship with imposter syndrome has always been the same as everybody else. Like, I just feel like a total fraud at times. And I think it's like very unique to this industry and very unique to our kind of set of people that are creatives. Um, 
you could have a half a million Instagram followers and feel like you don't belong and you feel like your work is shit and you, everything that you do is trash and you could be working with the biggest, biggest brands, biggest models, biggest agencies in the world and still feel like you don't belong. And you could be like me, 12 people looking at everything that I do, but fucking feeling like I'm crushing the world. Right. So yeah. I think that is extremely common, which like doesn't necessarily help me feel any better when I feel imposter syndrome. And I don't think anyone out there listening to this who also goes through imposter syndrome is going to feel better. Like, oh, cool. You feel that way too. Fuck me. I still feel like this. But the, all those feelings pass. I think like you just have to be like very cognizant of outlining your own successes and like sort of mitigating the underlying feeling that you're not good enough. And if you could do that, you could be successful in any career, not just a, a creative one. Yeah, because I mean, like, except for photo photography is not like my my full time thing. So like for me, it's after two two thirty, you know, whatever day, then like then it's photography for the most part. So it's for me, it's a very I would say on off. I can I can leave the paid side whenever I want it or if I want, you know, I, I'm not I'm not depending on it for a paycheck. So which is yeah. which is nice in that aspect because I don't then I'm not forced to put myself in the situations or like force myself to take shoots or. Yeah, so that's something Oof. that's been there, yeah. man. Been there. Yeah. Birthday parties. <laughs> Fuck me. Well, why did I do? Why am I doing this? Like, why am I? Why am I doing this? Been there. Yeah. yeah been there. I, I'm. I'm thankful that that stage of my journey has gone, and took a fucking long time. But like <laughs> now, I'm selective. Now I work with who I want to work with, and I shoot who I want to shoot with, and I get paid when I want to get paid, and collaborate with people who. I don't charge like these things are my decisions because I've reached the comfortability and the level that I needed to, but oh boy, yeah. there was a time that was not the case. <laughs> this... Oh, it's your dog's birthday. You want to have a fucking photo shoot of your dog eating? I'm free. <laughs> cool. So like, I'm so at it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Do you care if I shoot this on Polaroid specifically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but i'm with you man that's cool um yeah. dude i uh i am immensely appreciative of you uh spending this hour with me and coming on the pod and we could talk for fucking days about gear <laughs> about fucking photos um i'm a big fan of your work i think you're incredibly talented i'm a super appreciative of your friendship and you coming on man and i uh, can't see can't wait to see what you got going on for the rest of the year thanks man i appreciate it yeah we'll have to continue on instagram twitter until i get out to new york and they want to hit the shoots running. Oh, fuck yeah, man. Can't wait for it. Have a great rest of your day, buddy. All right, you too. Later. Later.